Welcome to episode 95 of the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Camisa, and that over there is Derek Tam hyphen Scott, a of product the- of the Haggerty podcast industry. Wait a minute. <laughs> Today, uh, we're talking about uh, the BMW M2, the new one. You. And I also. Mean, I took one photograph of it where it looked absolutely beautiful. I'll use that as the thumbnail for this uh, episode to lure people in. Look, the M2 is beautiful. And then, presto changer, we're really going to talk about... The Ferrari Dino. They're not Ferraris. Specifically. They don't say Ferrari. Yes, they are. No, they are shitboxes. They were not good enough for Enzo to put his name on it. Or were they? There's only one way to find out, which is to continue. By listening to us blather for the next hour on this subject... Uh, did we cover anything else? Some discussion of V6s? Of course, but we make fun of V6s all the time. And then you need a, a, a clap. Yeah. I'm doing the wind up. Oop, the table, the table has just combusted. There it is. Look at that. That was like a B minus at least. All right. Which graded on a curve for you is an A. A plus. Okay. <laughs> and the real clap in the background. Because <laughs> yours just wasn't good enough. <laughs> I know. I still, f- I, I still feel like naked without headphones. Oh, yeah. We, I, you're outside without a bra. And that was my joke on the <laughs> Supra episode when I was interviewing the, uh, the designer who did the Supra. We were outside and we pulled our masks off and it was like right in the middle of actual lockdown. And so we're outside in this courtyard and we're like eight feet away from each other and we shot the camera angles to make it look like we were closer. We take our masks off and I see him for the first time and I'm like, I feel naked like I went out without a bra on. And it was just a roar of laughing at all the people, the PR people who were there ready like to zap him every time he was saying something bad. Uh, but I feel like I just feel... They put shock collars on people when they... Uh... You no, know, they have PR people in the back going, shut up. He did a great job at sort of making it clear that he, without ever saying it, and it were to me indirectly or directly, that the Supra was not a successful design but the FT1 that they had originally designed was. Have you seen that car? Mm, yes, FT1? the concept. Yeah, and that was concept was based on Lexus LC 500. Um, and then the they had to graph that styling language onto the Z4 platform, basically. And it just, he was talking about the difficulty in doing so. But Because the hard points were in places that didn't facilitate yes, that They really transition. should have made that LC 500 based Supra. I mean, I don't know if it would be faster than the BMW, but. Whatever. Look better. Would certainly look better. Not that the, the super is bad looking. Uh, that's not why we're here today. Why are we here today? Because. Why are we here any day? Why are we on earth? Sorry. Why are you so miserable, Carmudgeon? <laughs> uh, why are we, we don't At know. At least I'm not questions. jet lagged today. <laughs> oh, that's right. So I loved going back to the comments from the last episode when Sam was here because it was a very different energy. It was the Sam and Jason like hyperactive show. And you sat in that corner very very irritated looking i was just so jet lagged i was <laughs> delighted not to have to say too much because i was just like i had gotten back the night before I after just, when you i mean when you come back from europe you stay awake then it ends up to the west coast it ends up being like a 24 hour day yeah. so yeah anyway i, was I, I thought to lunch you weren't going to make it to the shooting to the, the filming and then i thought you were actually going to fall asleep in the middle of it but you did stay awake the, but the audience has no way of knowing that you were jet lagged off your ass um, yeah. And so I love all the comments are like Derek's just, you know, the look on Derek's face is like contemplating all the things I did wrong in my life to get me to this point. <laughs> There's some oh, great no. comments. I didn't read yeah. them. Uh, well, poor Sam read them and he's like, they hate me. And I'm like, it was just a very different kind of show because it was, you know, the Sam and Jason reminiscing show. Yes. Love well, that. love that idiot. And he's now on the wall. Twice. So, yeah. Well, we have. Yes. He was. He was Times in two episodes. Two. Yeah. Yeah. James Engelman and Sam Smith. Um, um, but that is also not why we're here. That is also not why we're here. We are here today, dearly beloved. Uh, we're here today to talk about a marriage between... No, there is no marriage. Uh, Fiat and Ferrari, well, actually. Kind of, mm, but to get us there, I spent a week with a new M2. Which and has nothing to do with Fiat or it, Ferrari. There's Directly. Be a way. Yeah, there'll be a way. If we try hard enough, we'll okay. come back I'm, into it. I'm, I'm sitting here waiting to be dazzled by the transition that you They're make. both six-cylinder cars. So, oh, well okay. done. Here's, there, there we go. I spent a week with an M2 driving to and from this studio and doing sort of daily driver utility uh, duty while filming the Dino episode. So I did it. You guys know this in advance now. The uh, I did a revelations on Enzo's big voluptuous double Ds, uh, his double Dinos. 
and uh, that's 246 Dino and 308 Dino, obviously. And, and 206. Well, and 206, technically. Um, triple D's. That's not a real D's. size. <laughs> it's not? I mean, somebody will make one up. Anyway, the um, you can... Depends on your personal memory anatomy. Never mind. <laughs> We're just going to leave We're not going to go there. anyway. The, the, going from one of possibly the best cars I've ever driven ever. Ah, not yeah. bearing the lead. No. Into that M2. First of all, that M2 is enormous. It barely fit in the studio. We did one little shoot where we, we sort of shot a commercial for Haggerty Drivers Club that we may or may not run. Um, and we had to put it in the studio with the Dino and it barely fit. I mean, it basically has the same footprint as the, the van minivan. on the other yeah, hand with the van, which kind of barely fits in also. Um, that car is technologically from, from a from a driving dynamic standpoint is very good. It's very, very fast indeed. It's reasonably isolated. You could tell tell someone that this is a sort of luxury car where you took out the dampers and replaced them with solid pieces of lead. And it's I a think car. how uh, isolated is one of the first words you use to describe an M car seems problematic. The, the whole car is problematic because it is trying to be something it's not. It is a 3,900 pound luxury sedan turned into a sports coupe um and there is no joy left in this thing at all there is it is very good it's joy by virtue of g-forces i will tell that that thing generates a lot of cornering grip it's very fast it's very it can actually put the power down i mean it does the bmw rear end squat and yeah, sort of you know the, the sort of the bmw wiggle <laughs> there's the bushings moving yeah. around but um but I urge anyone who has the opportunity to go drive something like an M2 and then go drive something like a Ferrari 246 Dino because... <laughs> Let me just go in the corner and shit a Dino. Yeah, that happens all the time. Or drive... We can come... We could come no, up no, with no, a list yeah, of other any cars. Any number of other cars. I, I mean, let's we are, see. We have as our, a society gone in completely the wrong direction. Yeah. And I can't... I, I mean, air-cooled 911s are like this if you want a much more pedestrian or just abundant example. Not pedestrian, Yeah, but, but they don't have the experience that something like that. Like, my, well, it's are, closer to a Dino than go it is to a an Mark M2. Go drive a Volkswagen, for fuck's sake. I mean, the problem is that those bookends highlighted that we have gone in completely the wrong direction as enthusiasts, right? That M2, taken in the context of modern cars, is fine. It's fine. It's not, it's not better than the predecessor, I don't think in any way, um, which is a problem. But I have to remove the old car hat when I'm reviewing a new car. And I have to say, okay, well, and, you know, compared to everything else on the road, well, at least it's a manual and its steering isn't terrible. It's not good, but it's not terrible. Uh, the ride quality is unacceptable. The UX is a total non-starter for me. Like, Paolo, can you please turn your phone off? Uh, <laughs> it's just so much fun to fuck with him. Um, but we, uh, you know, we... Like, for example, every time you start that car, it turns on lane keep assist. Oh. Not warning, assist. Yeah, so it's steering for you, and then you try to go on a back road, and the car's like, that's not where the apex road. is. Try to go to the grocery store from my house. There's a tar strip that every fucking time I got in that car, it was like, no, nah, we're going to die. <laughs> and it rips the freaking wheel out of my hand. I would literally, <sighs> if I bought that car, I would return it right to the dealership and say, give me my money back or I'm suing you just over that and there there it's 15 menus deep there's no longer the little bmw center button that will allow oh, you to customize that no. gone you climate controls are in buried in, in a touch screen seated heat seated heats are buried in a touch screen it's it's an absolute nightmare to use however i'll ignore that and say from a driving perspective experience it's very fast you keep saying fast and not fun or joyful it's not there's no joy good. and no fun in it at all that Dino, I hate to say that you were right because you're always right, but mother of God, that is an experience. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about the experience is that it's not too much. You know, the Mira or the Countach is so overwhelming that you are, the, the car never really disappears. And by that, I mean, you are devoting so much of your mental processing power to sort of working around the idiosyncrasies of a car like a Boxer or a Countach or a Mira. And there is a rightness to the Dino, which where it, it disappears. It recedes into the background because it is an extension of yourself and you are just driving. And that is one of the characteristics that I think makes a really great driver's car. If I could, we've talked about this in the past, probably more offline than online. If I could wave a magic wand and turn your 
Mura into a pile of cash, I think you would turn that pile of cash then into a 300 SL going. I think I would turn that pile of cash into a 246 Dino. I know. I've had that exact thought. I've also had the thought as relates to the Stratos as well. <laughs> Those two cars to me are both like, and then you could turn it into a, a, a both, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could have the daily drive. I, I could see daily driving a 246 Dino. Yeah, yeah. That is, there's a stark difference. I mean, you texted me while you were shooting. You say, how, you know, or maybe it was you or Anthony who was, was asking, a, how different both. is the Stratos from the 246? They're very different mm -hmm. from each other. The engine and the transmission are the same. The Stratos is sort of terrifying and outer edge of control or out beyond the limit of control. Like, the, it just, the car is mechanical chaos. Uh, and the 246 is not like that. The 246 mm -hmm. is instinctive and intuitive it's comfortable it's a you know it, it could work as a touring car it's a little bit sort of maybe too breathless to be a touring car for like long distance high speed stuff um but it you know compared yeah. to like a big five liter right. car where you're kind of loafing along going 160k 100 miles an hour right. you know the dino's not great for that yeah it'll be at five six thousand rp yeah then, exactly yeah. so you know it's not quite a grand tour but it's a tour it's a sports car yeah. and that's the thing is it says gt on it but it's really kind of not right most cars will say i'm a sports car but actually like the m2 right i'm a sports car look at me with my bulging fenders and whatever that's a gt at i won't even get that give it that much credit it's a t it's a tour perhaps yes. not grand it's a petite tour um although it's a four thousand pound Some, tour. a large tour it's a large tour um <laughs> a corpulent tour but, not a grand <laughs> tour but a fat, a tour. A fat tour big fat ass i mean um but that Dino is okay. So let's let's compare three hundred eight. Three hundred eight is a later car. That's the V eight that we both own. We've talked extensively about this car. Uh, the two forty six is effectively the same design of chassis, same suspension, mm -hmm. same steering, same brakes, uh, same engine layout, it's in, um, tra transmission. Right in terms of the With transmission train, underneath. Transmission. Yeah, I should say drive line layout. Yeah, or power train. Same, same. Yeah, um, and. The 308 is a packaging miracle because it's only two inches longer than the 246. Yes, which is and so it has funny. back seats nominally. Yeah. But the 246 has a massive trunk. And I, so you can yes. see where the room went, right? Yes. They just pulled it out of the trunk and put it in the back seat. The 308 is the Grand Tourer, other than revs uh, and engine noise. But that, I mean, the, one of the defining characteristics of that car is the ride quality. And that's mm -hmm. kind of gone. And the, the, the Dino rides really well. But the Dino is like, that as a spider, I can't help but thinking is the world's best Miata. Mm. Structural concerns. Other, other. Well, anytime in a seventies or sixties or vintage car, generally when you cut off the roof, you notice it. Oh, yeah, this one was a coupe that I drove. Yes, um, I prefer the coupes. I prefer the aesthetics. The other thing yeah. that to me is just the pièce de résistance of that car aesthetically the is window. the rear window. I knew you were say that. Yeah. It's just so cool the mm -hmm. way the rear window like wraps around into the buttresses and you can look through four panes of glass if you look right. at when the, was, the car. When the have right you angle. ever looked through a window through a window? Yeah, <laughs> like it's you, like when you have a window in your house that goes into the house instead yeah. of going outside. Yeah. And you're like, well, that's weird. But well, and then there's one window that goes through another window that goes outside. I mean, that's yes. the thing. When you're standing at the corner of the car, you know, we're going to have to take a, take a picture of it. You can look through... The side window, which looks through the back window, which looks through the other back window, which looks through the other side, side window. window. And yes. It's fucking wild. Yeah, it's really fantastic. So uh, to me, I would want a GT for the structural rigidity. Mm -hmm. They're cheaper and you get the magical rear window and they're rarer. Most of the U.S. cars are GTSs. Mm -hmm. They didn't uh, they didn't sell that many of the coupes comparatively because the GTS was the, the, the open version was introduced relatively late mm -hmm. in the car's production and pr U.S federalization also arrived late uh and so those cars you know most of the u.s ones are gts's yeah, only all, two most. years of the six years of production so i did all the research of course i don't remember any of it because i'm an idiot but it was i think two years of the six years of production total of 206 246 were were federalized for u.s and yes i think 72 73 74 okay so, so 72 years, 70, right yeah, it's a two-year um, span but sure. One fully one third of all Dinos sold were sold in the U.S., so it was actually a huge hit. And if you look at the build, uh, the, the the list of VINs at the end, almost everything was U.S. Yep. I mean, you know, part of that was making up for lost time, and then two thirds of them were convertibles for yep. GTSs instead of mm -hmm. GTs. Um, I don't this the car that I drove was a Euro car, um, mm -hmm. which has the key is in German. The key, it says you know Stadt and whatever the fuck it says in German. Um, so I know that it was 
definitely probably i think it was a swiss market but anyway it came in germany that engine i would not want to make any less power it's it's quick it's quick enough yeah um, i mean that what is that car it's a high, mid to high sixes to 60 yeah six well and the u.s cars were seven nine yeah by the end i mean they got desmogged this is the time when you know but at least they were here yeah um so the all right let's talk about the, the whole dino story because this is how i made the whole episode was explaining that so for most of my sort of automotive life from the outside all i've ever heard was dino was a less than brand because yes. ferrari said and the market reflected this i mean now these cars are quite costly but when i would be talking to customer when i started in this business they were 17 no, no, they were like a quarter of what they in cost 1917 now. is what i'm sorry <laughs> they were a quarter period 25 <laughs> cents um Inflation, man, that's a bitch. Uh, no, they were like ten or fifteen thousand dollars when they were new. Um, yeah, they were like fifteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars because a nine eleven was ten thousand dollars. It was a big price difference. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of guys would be like, "I bought one of these in college because they were cheap, and I wanted a Ferrari or a similar." Uh, and they were just like you say, they were the redheaded stepchild, not redheaded. They were this the bare aluminum cylinder headed magnesium val- valve covered. Uh, of magnesium. magnesium valve mm-hmm. covers yeah treated um, magnesium stepchild had yeah, stepchild which sounds rather good actually when you put it like that <laughs> uh but yeah they were the sort of unloved like oh i see you can't afford a real ferrari type of mm-hmm. ferraris and that was uh, something that happened in the secondary market and you know all this this lore about 12 cylinder car you know being real ferraris and eating 12 cylinders type so of guess thing. where that lore came from uh david it's, e davis no even worse uh or better there Part of something I don't think I ever realized was when you do a first review of a car, the first sort of words that are written on that car really do become the defining thing on it. And that's a big pressure. Um, And so PR people will really do everything they can when we're reviewing, when journalists are reviewing cars, to make sure that your first impressions are correct. And if you slam a car early on. Yeah. Not necessarily correct. Good. Good. True. <laughs> if you slam a car early on or you, you create a narrative, right. it's you, often it, very it difficult. A, it's a tire track that people can't get out of. Exactly. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes the, you know, the public forms its own opinion. But from everything I can see, the whole lore about Ferraris being 12-cylinder cars comes from one quote, one time in one magazine from Paul Frere. Mm. In the... Th- the 246 Dino, uh, 206 Dino original road and track test. I think it was, I think it was 206. He said, Enzo Ferrari once said to me, Ferrari is a 12 cylinder car. Uh, and therefore this, De- this, this, this new 206 is not a Ferrari. That's why it's called Dino. And I think that quote is what started the whole, this is a less than brand. Mm-hmm. And so as I was doing research on these cars, what, what really struck me is let's transport back to Enzo Ferrari for a second. Enzo was born in 1897, 1898, some couple of years, 98. Um, his father, and I'm giving away half this episode, but his father, Oh, guys still watch the revelations please it's going to be a couple months it's in it's going to be an edit for a while um enzo's ferrari was named alfredo enzo's father named his first son enzo's older brother alfredo so named after his father when eight enzo was 18 so 1916 the two of them died from the flu the 1916 flu which was not the 1718 major horrible spanish influence that almost killed enzo a year later or two years later so enzo grew up from 18 on with a dead father and a dead brother both named alfredo when he had his first kid at however old he was 38 i think he was pretty old um he named him alfredo after his father and dead father and dead brother that kid pops out with muscular dystrophy and leads a very, very painful and dis- short. short life. Died at 24. And muscular dystrophy is an I'm fine, I'm fine, la, 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 dead. It's a horrible journey. Yeah, it's You're, like a debilitating, yeah. You were sickly throughout your whole life. And so Enzo, first of all, we've got to remember, Enzo, when he found out that his wife was pregnant, hung up his driving goggles and helmet I guess, and never it's raced more again. Leather thing. More of a leather thing. Never raced again because yeah. he didn't want his child to grow up without a father. 
Okay, so now let's transport ourselves in, into this guy's mind. His first child and the only legitimate child, right? The only yes. only child he ever had with his his wife, because later, many men, twenty years later, after she died, he finally admitted that he did have another illegitimate yes, son, Piero. Piero, but who took his name also at that point? Who took his name? Right, but prior he was not allowed to admit anything. That he was a Ferrari, exactly. yeah. But later, after Laura died, he and changed by the way, his name to Piero Ferrari. Divorce was illegal in Italy until 1975. Things you don't know. Mm. Like, I didn't know this. Uh, so he couldn't divorce Laura. Um, that was her name? Yes. yes. Yeah. Couldn't divorce Laura. 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 Yeah. Um, and she got, she went apparently crazy after, uh, after Alfredino died. So anyway, so Enzo loses his father brother, hangs up his driving goggles when his wife gets pregnant, never races again to make sure that he's there for this kid. The kid comes out and has some severe health issues and dies at 24 while he was helping Yano work on Vittorio the Yano, yeah. who is the engine designer who came to Ferrari from Lancia and was previously at Alfa Romeo. Mm -hmm. So he designed the 8C engine, probably the 6C also at Alfa Romeo. And then he went to Lancia, did a bunch of development work at Lancia, although he was not as book educated, mm -hmm. I guess, not as much education, but more technical, like hands-on knowledge. And so he was sort of pushed out to Ferrari because they got a new technical director at mm. Lancia who was more like, you must have a degree and you must, you know, ein, zwei, ein, zwei, you know, very orderly. He's, He's not German, but it was that sort of mentality of being at, you know, I think you must so have a good education mm. and not as much practical emphasis. Right. And so Jano left and went to Ferrari at that time. And Alfredo, Ferrari's son, Little Alfredino. Alfredo Alfredino was pushing Ferrari and pushing Ferrari as a company and Yano to to make a V six. They made a V six. It never ran before he died. He died at twenty four. Yes, it was a few months after yeah. he died that it ran um, for the first time. And then they started racing it. This was nineteen fifty. He died in fifty six. Middle of fifty six. Right. So here we are, ten years later. Sixty seven is really when two hundred six starts coming out. Mm -hmm. Paul Frere writes. A Ferrari, Enzo once told me a Ferrari is a 12-cylinder car. Excuse me for a second. By that point, what engine configurations had Ferrari made? Uh, inline four. Yeah. Uh, V6. Mm -hmm. V12. Two different V6s. Three yes. different V6s. Yes, because the last one was the Rocky one. 60 degrees, 65 degrees, and then 120 degrees. They made three different V6s. Uh, they had done an inline eight. The Avor Ferrari's the, first engine was a yes, straight eight. Yeah, in the this was before Ferrari as a company was founded, because when he left Fiat, no Alpha, Alpha, they made him not. They made him promise not to make a car with his own name on it for mm -hmm. four years. Yeah. And so the first Ferrari built is not called a Ferrari, right. but it was an inline eight. Right, I think it was two liters. Um, yeah, little thing that mm -hmm. wasn't a Ferrari, but was mm -hmm. a Ferrari. And this was like 1940. And they had made a V8. And they'd made a straight six. Did they make a V8 in addition to racing the V8 they used that they got from Lancia? Or was that just... I don't know if they ever made their own V8, but I they definitely they won a F1 championship with a V8 that they inherited from Lancia okay. in 1955. Fair enough. So yes. my point, yeah, my point <laughs> they is... They ran number of cylinders? Yes, they did it. Except yep, for three. They did an experimental three-cylinder. I think that was later on. But by the time Paul Frere made that quote that we said, Enzo once told me, first of all, we can't fact check that. Mr. Ferrer is no longer with us. He was Neither is Enzo. Neither is Enzo. Um, but uh, yeah, all of this, this is why this is a less than car, I think came from Ferrer, who gave the car a, a sparkling review. I mean, yeah, he called it actually a revelation. So, mm. and of course, in the show Revelations, I have to make fun of him. I'm like, you want a revelation? Here's a fucking revelation. Ferrari had made every goddamn engine layout there was. So fuck you and your quote too, um, was sort of my sentiment. Um mm -hmm. And then you think about this. This kid dies, this horrible, terrible death where Enzo in his, in his, in his uh, diary had been keeping track of his liver enzyme levels and all this other shit about this kid. I mean, he, you know, this was his son. This was yeah. going to be the, the, the heir, heir to, the, to the throne. Um, and he kicks off at 24. And then they, of course, name the V6 after him. And then... He comes out with a new lineup of car and names it after his dead son, his dead father, and his dead brother. dad. Uh, but yeah, brother. Yeah. Dead father and dead, the dead, 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 dead dad. dad. Yeah. Um, Impressive. I just found this so sad. The first intro that I wrote, it was so like, you think you know about this car? You think this is an insult? Let me put yourself in his shoes. And I went through the whole thing in really sad terms. And I was like bawling by the time I read it out loud. I'm like, I got to get rid of this. And so then, of course, I have to make it funny because you can't yes. be that serious. But this is yeah. sad shit. Yeah. You know, Enzo's black tie and Enzo's 
dark sunglasses, sunglasses started when when his son died. And basically anytime he was not on the road for the rest of his life, he would go to his son's grave every day. That's horrifying. Yeah. Yano also lost his, lost his son, but killed himself. Yeah. Because it was shortly thereafter. I mean, you got to think parents are not supposed to, when, when the world works as it should, parents don't lose their kids. Yeah. Um, and so it really deeply offended me when I really started thinking about all of the people who are like, that's less than, um, because it's just, Enzo was too embarrassed to put his own name on it. Mm -hmm. Well, fuck you, right? Yeah. Somebody who named something after their son who died and lived this horrible life. I mean, it sounds like the kid was wonderful and there's a lot of romanticized thing. Like Enzo gave uh, Alfredino c credit for the V6. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of period Maybe stuff. Maybe conceptually. Right, a lot of period stuff that say you have to allow him some latitude when he lost his child, right? Sure. Which is a way of saying, okay, he had nothing to do with it, but he did push Yano he yeah, did come up with the idea. Yeah. He hey, did, we should he make didn't this. design the engine. Right. For Formula and it was done for Formula 2. Yes. Um so they could race in Formula 2 yeah. because Italians they he wanted to give a stepping stone for Italian mm -hmm. drivers to drive something to then make it to Formula 1. Right. Because you can't just go into Formula 1 even then. Even then. And then 1967 there was a rule change. It was the predecessor yes. to FIA. 500 units. 5 you had to make 500 units and at the time for, for a Formula 2 engine. Right, you had to make 500 units in 12 months f to participate in Formula 2, starting from the 67 season, and Ferrari's total production for across the board for all cars. 700. That year, but previ yeah. it previously was always under 500. Yes, so they for would all of their cars. For They're all of the cars. Cylinder cars. Yep. So they would have had to effectively double production for the entire company mm -hmm. just to be able to continue to participate in F1. F2. F2, yeah. yeah. And so the you know when Fiat approached them and said, hey, would you make an engine for our flagship sedan? That's how they, that's why it was okay to Ferrari because we forget, everyone forgets. Enzo didn't give a shit about street cars. And if you understand that, you understand so many of the decisions that this company took. Um, he only would make those street cars if it helped him racing or paid for racing or did something with racing. And so the the making the, the Dino V6 for the Fiat Cupid Spider and ultimately Lancia Stratos came about because he had to in order to continue to participate in Formula 2. Right. And that was a sort of lifeline from Fiat because, of course, at this point, Fiat is sort of courting Ferrari and eventually Fiat does take over the road car production mm -hmm. side of Ferrari two years later in 1969. Mm -hmm. But, that you know, realizing that Ferrari wasn't going to be able to make 500 additional cars with a different engine per year, Fiat's like, here's this Bertone Coupe and this Pininfarina convertible that are powered by this engine so that you can run it in Formula 2, mm -hmm. which is the... V6, which eventually ends up in the 206 and 246. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe differentiate between 206 and mm -hmm. 246. Uh, shorter wheelbase, shorter overall length than the 206. It's the predecessor. They made them in much smaller numbers before, and they never came to the U.S. The so, yeah, the car de debuted as, as the 206. With a two-liter, six-cylinder, 2.0, 206. Six. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they stretched the wheelbase for the 246. I don't either, actually. I, I there's so much misinformation about these cars that uh, that I couldn't get a reliable length number for both of them to see if they, it was actually longer or not. Um, and I wound I up finding, well, I wound up finding a. I don't think they are actually, to be honest with you. Uh, if anything, it might might be just be bumper differences because I found. Two, and I'll have an insert of this. I found two photos shot in the same studio on the same camera with the same lens of both cars on a hard side side profile, and you can. I put them on top of each other, lined up the front bumper, the door opening, the, and the front wheel, and you can watch. You can look at the cars back and forth and sw switch between the two images and see the car doesn't. I mean, there's, a, there's always going to be a small variation in the angle of the car, so it's hard to tell. But the only thing that really moves substantially is the rear wheels. And the opening and the wheel definitely move significantly. Hmm. So they so moved... They the, lengthened the wheelbase, yeah. but didn't change the overall length. I don't think they... Hypothesis. Substantially, right? It could just be, you know, a couple... A, a fraction of an inch here or something else like that. But it was a three-inch wheelbase stretch, right? Two? Two inch. Three inch. Something like that. Big. Big wheelbase stretch. Uh, probably for stability. You'd mm -hmm. think, right? I mean, that was a, right around the time when Porsche... The 911 did the same thing between 68 and 69. Yeah. So right exactly at the same time, wouldn't it have been? 68 and 69. For Where they were like, well, these cars with the engines in the back are a little bit wayward. We have yeah. to figure out how to get the <laughs> weight Help. It, it yeah. closer to the wheelbase, yeah. if not inside of it. Yeah. Um, but man, did it work. So, all right. So 206 was an alloy body, which is pretty cool. So it was a steel frame, tube frame, done at Scaglietti. Sc Scaglietti. Scaglietti. Scaglietti, I did not realize, was wholly owned by Ferrari shortly yes. after this point. 
Yes. Um, so that was their in, in-house coach builder. Um, uh, alloy body riveted body. Body panels were riveted to the frame. Uh, engine was all alloy, built by Fiat. Mm-hmm. Which is in Turin and then transported to Maranello where they were put in the cars. Mm-hmm. Um, but the cars were built on the on the Ferrari line. Mm-hmm. The VIN plate for the the sort of serial number plate actually says Ferrari on it, and the model yes. number is two four six. You know, but anyway, uh, back to the two hundred sixes. When they went to the two forty six, that was I think Fiat's influence um, at that point came in. So the motor they had already satisfied the homologation requirements for the two zero. Mm-hmm. So they did no longer had to make it out of aluminium for Formula Two, so they could switch to a cast iron block. Mm-hmm. And is this the only iron block? Ferrari? Mm. Were the 12s, the Colombo was all aluminum, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. There's probably some exception to this from some experimental engine at some yeah. point. But an interesting question, yeah. Yeah. It's a, So it went to just a conventional cast iron block. Um, uh, board and stroked out to 2.4 liters. Um, and the transmission was redesigned at some point. Yes, I think they at some point came out with a completely new transmission. Yeah. Uh, all the internals layout was the same so it's it's crazy because the you know if you can imagine from the starting from the passenger side is the front of the motor um because it's transverse so going towards the driver side crankshaft power comes out of the crank at the driver side of the engine through the clutch this is left hand drive by the left hand drive yeah and then down three drop gears to the input shaft of the transmission which is then parallel to the crankshaft and almost directly underneath the crankshaft and so the transmission is under the engine parallel to it um, which is a crazy layout Um, yeah i mean it's done for reducing the overall length Mm -hmm. of the car but what it did was really raise the the, center of gravity um and that wasn't rectified with the boxer yeah well, that was the joke is that all that flat 12, like the whole point of a flat engine is, is that like lower it and center of gravity. You know, which is like the thing they, and then of course, and then of course, the transmission's you know, the, underneath it. Right. And so the Testeros, the, the TR, uh, the, the BB became, you know, that whole lineup of mid-engine transverse 12s. Longitudinal. Uh, li- uh, yeah, mid-engine, longitudinal, flat, flat 12s. 12s wound up. That's the Testerosa, right? Because yes. there's so many variants of this that if you say 365 BB, well, I don't think most people know what the fuck that is because I didn't until I did research for that. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, those wound up with the engine on top of the transmission. So you have this big, huge, hulking, probably 800-pound flat 12 mm-hmm. sitting atop the transmission that's probably like neck height yeah. <laughs> behind you in the car. It was totally killed handling. Yes, um, that's all true. But um, but yeah, so the 246 was just an update. It was steel-bodied. So they, not only was the engine switched from alloy to iron, the body went to steel. It's probably why they built a lot more of them, or a contributing factor. It's a lot more manufacturable to, right. to mass produce in steel. And that by that point, Fiat owned Ferrari's road car division. Enzo didn't give a flying fuck about anything, at that. I'm sure, at that point. His homologation was complete. He was still racing the, the Dino V6, the two liters, mm-hmm. um, or the alloy block cars. Um, and so this car that I've got was a 246, Mm-hmm. Um, they're quick. I mean, you know, like we said, six and a half to 60, they were 15 through the 15 through the quarter mile, which mm-hmm. was pretty quick at the time. Um, and then the two forty six broke motor trends record for the highest skid pad grip ever, ever mm. created. So it wasn't quite world beating speed, but it was definitely world beating handling. Yeah. Nine eleven was S the top of a drawer. Nine eleven was priced just slightly faster in a straight line. Certainly than two Oh six. Was it also two forty six? Forty six also. Well, for us right. magazines, of course, I don't know about European magazines. Yeah. Um, okay. So have you driven a two Oh six? Um, no, I've driven an L series 246. So the L series 246 is basically there were some changes that you use to differentiate a 206 from a 246, except for the L series cars have some of the 206 characteristics. So L series cars, the really early 246s, are worth a lot more than later 246s because it still has some of the 206s are more valuable than 246s, even though 246s are higher performance because it's aluminum bodied and yeah. an aluminum block and they made a lot fewer of them. They made 154 total according to the Dino Compendium book, which okay. I borrowed because it's a $3,500 book. Um, yeah. I don't have an expense account like that, but uh, really cool book. But yeah, they made 154 and I think that includes four prototypes uh, that they mm-hmm. eventually sold. So yeah, 206s are incredibly rare. Yeah, think about that, and therefore valuable. Yeah, so I've only driven the L series, which is has the knockoff wheels, for example, for example, which the two forty six usually do not, and some interior changes. Um, Did you know that? So the car that I drove for the shoot is the prototype that they used to put the five lug wheels on it. So oh. that's in like in the Classic A certification. Apparently, it's all oh, that's cool uh, in there. Uh, and 
in the Dino Companion book while I was doing research, I noted that they, he said, you know, all early Dinos have different lug, nut, uh, lug bolts front to rear. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's strange. And it, when Fiat made the changeover with a bunch of other stuff, one of the changes they made in cost cutting was going, getting rid of Gerling, what's the French brake company? Gerling, uh, and replacing with German brakes. Ate. Ate. Um, and I thought, oh, well, at that point, surely they got rid of this stupid mismatched lug bolts. So the car that was that that I filmed was on tires that are not that old, but in the 20 miles to get it to the studio, the tires went from looking fine to looking like the ground in the desert and the, they're terrible. So I swapped on the wheels and tires for my 308 just for the back roads driving scene, just for safety. And I did not realize that 308 also has mismatched lug bolts. Oh, really? They are so long they... in the front and short in the back. You cannot swap them. Huh. I mean, you could, and who knows? It'll probably hit something. Yeah. But like, who does that? That's asinine. Stupid. Um, prototypically Italian. Prototypically Italian. How very dare they? Um, but the cars feel very similar in a lot of ways and very different. Yes. And others. And you've I, driven both, so the, the, tell us. Well, so have you. <laughs> yes. Um, to me, they feel more similar than different, right? If you take the entire population of automobiles that exist, if you mm. say, and you drive a 246 and you say, what car does this most, or drive a 308 actually, or maybe it's because I drove a lot of 246s before I ever drove a 308. Mm. And I, you know, you get in the car, here's, okay, let me back up. Here's what actually happened. <laughs> I drove a lot of 246s and I drove a lot of th late 308s, mm. like the fuel injected Pininfarina bodied cars. And they feel quite different from each other. And in so, that. In, in that one is genuinely wonderful and that the other one is garbage. <laughs> we have discussed yes. this at length. And so when I drove a th a, a th an early 308, a, a GT4, the Bertone designed mm -hmm. car, for the first time I was the expecting Dino. it. Yes, the Dino. I was expecting it to drive like a 308 and it doesn't. It drives more like a 246. And so if you, you drive a 308 for the first time, having driven the other two, you say, what, what car does it most remind you of? It's a 246. Mm -hmm. they, they feel similar in a lot of ways. Obviously the, the 246 is lighter it's more delicate the engine is, and powertrain is is quite different as well but the sort of overall response and vibe to me is is pretty similar in those cars so do you know how much the weight difference is between the two cars if you had to guess 150 pounds no i would have guessed having driven both i would have guessed 500 mm -hmm. and it was something in the twos 225 to 250 uh, I was going to weigh this. I still couldn't. And the car's still here. I was going to weigh the 246 just to see. Um, the 308, R308 GT4 was 3,025 pounds. Uh, not heavy. I mean, by modern car standards, heavy by my That's car standards. It's within three pounds of my 964. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that car was, wait, did you say 3025? 3025, admittedly with only five eighths of a tank of gas. Because I just yeah, did, my 964, I think, was 3026. Oh, wow. Fine. <laughs> Within one pound. Yes. Um, guess I'm going to have to go get... Was that full tank or... That was um, more than half, but less than full tank. Yeah, so same. Were. So same. Um, you know, which... I, I Look, it's my heaviest car, um, but 3,000 pounds for a 2 plus 2 V8 mid-engine large kind of thing with... Large by my standards again, with air conditioning and power windows. I don't think it's all that bad. Um, but apparently the 246s were 2,800-ish. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, they're not light, right? But they feel light. Yes. That's the the control forces are light. The steering is light. The shifter is light. The un unbelievable. That's the biggest difference. Like you get into a two forty six little. D the clutch is just Honda light. Mm. The shifter is long throw, but Honda light. Yeah. Not you know it's variegated shifter. It's, it's its own very different thing. Um, but it's so it's a single finger through yes. through the gears yeah. where the three hundred eight. Early cars are really apparently terrible. All the road tests bitched about the 308 GT4 clutches being unusable. Our car's not that bad. It's normal. Yeah, it's lighter than I would say most of the 308s I've driven. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that, that is totally fine to me. But the shifter is, there's a lot of stiction. It's not yeah. like... This, this shifter feels like most dog leg gated Ferrari mm -hmm. five-speed shifters in the 308. 308. They're almost sort always of, like that. Testarossas right. are like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even like 550s are like this, are actually. Really? Yeah, I mean, that it's much, like a, That much effort? They're surprisingly, hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I couldn't get over that difference. And that really sets up the whole car. Yeah. Between the that lever and the, is longer also, so you have a little more leverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then you get parking. The steering is way lighter on the 246. Mm -hmm. And to once you're moving, it's 
I mean, the car feels like it's got power steering. Like it doesn't yeah. really wait up. The 308s is just as light when you're moving, but then really weights up in the corners. Yeah. So it's interesting that they have the same steering, same rack, yeah. or, uh, and same suspension design, different tuning, obviously. Um, but the 308 feels that much heavier. Yeah. Um, if but you both had, of them feel much lighter than most other Ferraris. Oh, yeah. um, if you had to rank, which one drives better, according to you? <sighs> For an, a combination, this is like the EPA combined cycle, not just city, not just highway. So this is not just back roads blasting like an idiot. This is overall, I could... I know. would choose a 246. Yeah, me too. It's okay. not, but but the thing is, then you take into account price. Yeah. Right, when you take into account price, that's why when I was like, at eh, the 3.8, I was like, it's close enough to a 246 and given the cost difference, good enough. Yeah, because they know? are now almost 10 times the cost difference, right? Yeah. Depends on the example so of each. But a nice yeah. 308 GT4 is 100000 bucks plus a bit and a nice... Uh, an, yeah, so there's a big variation in values of 246s based on configuration. So late cars, you could get flares, which are really crude looking, but they're fender yeah. flares that to oh. fit wider wheels, Campagnolos. Mm -hmm. And then you would also get the Daytona seats that had the dark uh, alternating inserts mm -hmm. that, that they were used in Ferrari Daytonas. And so the hot setup is flares and chairs, mm -hmm. uh, as they call it. And those things, yeah, a, a wonderful flares and chairs GTS in a good color with good history can tickle, you know, almost a million, which is pretty unusual lately because that was five years ago. That was a 500, 550 so car. Uh, and then mm -hmm. still like a GT with n no noteworthy configurations would be like f in the fours, probably threes, high threes okay. still. Yeah. So it really depends on which flavor of 246. Well, same with two, uh, 308. So you think, uh, you know, a late, like a 1978 U.S. car with D-smog, no power um, yes. in boxer paint scheme with the U.S. bumpers in a uh, color is 30. 50. 35 to 50 is what I was going to say. Yeah. In a, in okay, con condition. And then a Euro... Vetroresina, the fiberglass ones. Yeah, are like 200. There were fiberglass GT4s? I'm talking no. three, 308 GT4s. Oh, oh, um, GT4s. Yeah. Yeah, um, Euro GT4 seems to top out around 150. Yeah. So there is really almost a 10x price difference between a 308 GT4 and a 246, you know? Correct. Um, but I price. Price taken into consideration, 308 all day. Yeah. Using it every day, actually they're pretty even because even though the 308, the 308 has a back seat ish, which is great for cargo. And I did actually put four people in that car. Poor, poor them. Yes. All of them, all four of you. But um, it, no, it's, it's the same reason as it's a nice thing to have a backseat in a 911. You can throw your shit in the back, right? Mm -hmm. And occasionally, yeah. if you need something in an emergency, you can do it. But actually, I think the, two, the 246 would be easier to live with on a daily basis or regular use because the door, yes. the problem with the 308, and I didn't, I, there was so much in this episode that I didn't get a chance to get into. But part of the packaging miracle that is the 308, where Gandini fit to an extra row of seats, and of uh, uh, ninety two more degree, cylinders. Well, and it's not even just two more cylinders. Think about it. It's because they're transverse. That's yes, width wise, right, right. but length wise, you went from a sixty five degree V six to a ninety degree V eight. Right. It's a huge difference in in longitudinal length of that engine. Um, width, which would longitudinal be longitudinal when installed in the car. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, and he managed to fit in a back seat and that in, and it's only two inches longer, which is crazy. Yeah. But because of that, the driver's seat went so far forward and the, the door didn't. So you have to swing that door really wide, fully wide open. And then you're still kind of skirting in forward. It's, it's a bit of a difficult car to get in and out of. Um, and that's not the case with the, with the 246. Mm -hmm. So uh, sort of daily use, I think the 246 would be just a slightly easier to live with. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, a ten price, ten times the price, I can't do one. But I would have one of those cars. Yes, it is a Ferrari that does not disappoint, and there are a lot of Ferraris, a much higher proportion of Ferraris that exist disappoint than should. But maybe that's because we hold them to such a high standard. I thought so too, and you know, I always, I always worry that you know we're judging these as Ferraris, and you know, maybe the Dinos get a, a get a free ride. And it's really, it's always interesting when I do the revelations research is to look at the arc of the reviews, right? So you read mm -hmm. the first reviews, and then you read the sort of mid cycle of the car two or three years later as Used usually a, a comparison test, yeah. right? It'll appear again, and then often. If there are six or seven year cars, by the end the car companies will come up, wrap around like we haven't talked about this car in a while, and we'll do this. 206 
w- right out of the box was like this thing is spectacular it's an it's perfectly neutral and handling it rides really well if anything there's a lot of engine noise um which could get tiresome on a long trip but otherwise the car is basically without vices and be a little more it. powerful they didn't. They, they said didn't, that. Yeah, they said that because uh, because it's not of an S. Yes, but you know, the, the basically the only real criticism of the car was the steering wheel obstructs a bunch of the of the of the instruments, and it's hard to check the oil because of where the dipstick is. Shut the fuck up. All right. Yes. So there's that. Agree. Two forty six comes out. Everyone's like unanimously this car is even better because the two hundred six was apparently not particularly torquey down low. Yes. Neither was the 246, but yeah, but it you went from like 130 to 160 or 70 foot pounds of torque. Yeah. And that makes a big difference. Big difference in torque. Um, and, and it was like a thousand RPM sooner, I believe also. Yeah. It was much lower instead of 6,000, it was 5,000 um, or like, like 5,800. It was 4,800, but that motor pulls, I, I didn't, this car is sort of a museum piece and I didn't want to really beat the shit out of it. I, I, I pulled to an indicated indicated seven grand with incredible ease. Mm -hmm. Definitely could have gone more, but I didn't want to do anything to it. Um, Red line on those is 7,800. It was 8,000 on the two liters. Um, So all of the reviews out of of the box for 246 were incredible. It was like, this is even better. This is, the car is unbelievable. Perhaps it's a little expensive given its competition, but uh, wow, what a car, what a car, what a car, what a car. Stayed that way right through the end. The, The convertible, it was actually a convertible that that broke the skid pad grip um, for Motor Trend. It was GTS, even with the floppy chassis. Um, and then the 308 comes out. And man, were those first reviews not pleasant. I mean, they were basically, you can imagine there, everyone's reaction was, what the fuck is this, right? You have 206, 246 are, are replaced by 308. And that was something, that was a branding and product planning mistake quote unquote mistake on Ferrari's behalf because they ultimately changed the formula completely, right? Visually, you went from a what looks like a small, sultry, sexy, it's like a race car form. Yeah, it was exactly what it was. And they were Pininfarina styled it after the race, the, the V6 mid-engine race cars. And and then you have this crazy, severe, angular, 80s almost um wedge with that appears three times the size, even though it's not, yeah. um, appears it's like an awkwardly massive. long wheelbase. Yeah. And it's, and it's unexpectedly sedan like in the way like a 400 is like mm-hmm. Ferrari 400 is. And I, and Ferrari just totally changed the recipe of what quote, quote unquote Dino meant. Um, and so you, when you look at the car, it's got some awkward angles, but ultimately it's, it's, I think a great looking car. I love the way it looks. I do too. Not traditionally But it's beautiful. an acquired taste. Yeah. It took me years to come around. Yeah. Me too, actually, funny enough. Um, but the road Whereas test... Whereas the first time you see a 246 or 206, you're just like, this is one of the I most just beautiful done. cars yep. well, yeah. ever made. Yeah, spectacular. A little awkward from some angles in the rear. Yeah. Um, but doesn't matter. Um, so the original road tests were like, what the fuck is this when the 308 came out? But it drives even better than the Dino does. And there, I found a couple Comparos. And, and early on, they thought, well, this is an even more sporting car than the, than the 246 was. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, it was, it's defining characteristics are that engine is a monster and it rides really well. Not necessarily that it's more sporty than the, yeah. Dino, than the 246. Probably more competent is, is maybe what they meant. Like higher limits and just a swifter car right. over the road. Yeah, it's wider. So yeah. it's the same suspension design, but wider. Right. L- l- an eight inch longer wheelbase. So it's much more stable. Yeah. Um, and a shit ton more firepower. I mean, yeah. It was so a lot basically faster. over the road, you're traveling a lot faster. Right. And that's probably what they what were doing. Yeah. Because it wasn't, doesn't feel like a sports car as any more than a sport, sports car than 246 did. But so there was a lot of like, what is this? Ferrari has kind of go- gone in the strange direction. And remember, 1975, the only Ferrari you could buy in the US was a 308 GT4, which didn't have a single Ferrari badge visible on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. So a very confusing time for Ferrari sort of branding. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was awesome to go back and watch the later, re- to go back and read the later reviews of the car because they're like, this is a spectacular driver's car. It's transcendent. It's I absolutely love it. Yeah, maybe a little bit awkward, but wow, what a real Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Then the 308 GTB comes out, mm-hmm. which was basically the, D- 246 Dino's styling updated by 10 years or yeah. 20 years um, with the 308 GT4. Oh, 10 years. Powertrain. 10 years, right? Yeah, I think the Dino 60s. was a little bit old looking already when it came out. I think the Dino came out in like 67. I mean, it, in 66, the Miura came out. 
Yeah, but I think the I think the styling of the Dino very much looks early sixties. Yeah, like a two fifty LM. Yeah. Mm, interesting. And the so what I think is that the two forty six Dino kind of looked like the or two oh six, I guess. The the six cylinder Dino looked a little bit like a glorified version of the past. And the three oh eight looked like a nightmarish version of the future. It's sort of what I wrote in the script. Like Oh, of the GT four. Of the GT four, yeah. Yes. Um so you have this craziness and then the three oh eight GTB is like looking forward towards the nineteen eighties mm -hmm. from the Dino. So it really is almost a 20 year phil philosophy. That's me defending my sure. position. But yeah, so 10, 10 plus years later, you wind up having this 308 GTB come out, which is one of the most beautiful cars I've ever laid eyes on. I, I can't stop staring at them. They're beautiful, but I absolutely hate driving them. You should um, drive a carbureted one just to confirm if you haven't. I would, I think that would make all the difference. The, the yeah, arc, but the steering pos the position and the way the chassis doesn't change. reacts, yeah, you still have that. But it's really interesting to watch that arc because it was that all of those G 308 GTB reviews started out with, hello, the Dino is back. We, we got, the, you know, finally Ferrari's replaced the 246 with a worthy successor. Well, it only came out in 1976, the GTB. The GTB, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was only gone for two years. But remember, two years is a long time in the real world. Like, looking back, two years is a flash. Yeah. But two years... Of, of waiting we're looking at that gt4 going where the hell is ferrari going yeah. and then then the gtb comes out and it's a genuine optical predecessor to the uh, a successor. successor to 246 and the reviews were like off the charts like this thing is a return to form and it's amazing because it has the 308 gt4's firepower with the 246's looks and blah 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 blah, blah. and then the reviews that they peaked early and man, did they go downhill at the end. That car was like, this is a pile of shit. The driving position sucks. It crashes over bumps. It's got no suspension travel. I can't see out of it. And it sounds like shit. And I have been wondering for years why the 308 engine went from sounding so unbelievably magnificent in the 308 GT4 to absolutely uninspiring and awful in the 304 Valvole. Um, which is a GTB with four four head, four valve head on it, and what, it was an Australian magazine pointed it out. When they went from GT4 to GTB, the exhaust went from two equal length runners of six of th of four cylinders, cylinders each to a collector. It was a four into two into one, um, and it just sounds like a four cylinder. And then the fuel injection at the end just finished it off completely, so you don't you don't get the Weber intake noise. Mm. Um, so finally, we have an explanation why they sound so different because the 308 GTB does not sound good. I'm guessing the carbureted ones don't either. Yeah, I mean, you at least get the Weber noise and right. so you have that joyful part of it, but... But not... Yeah, I mean, it's just... It's not on the same level. It's an unequal length headered or unequal length exhaust flat plane V8, which means it sounds like a dis slightly discordant four-cylinder. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is listening to the re audio recordings that we did. So we did the back road drive, of, as I always do, of the 246 and then my 308, um, which for the record, I hated using for this episode. I do not want to use my own cars and I don't want to feature my own cars. But this 246 fell into my hands and it's white. Yeah. And I was like, God damn it. I need Now I need a white GT4 and I, mine's ivory. Our car is ivory. And so it was close enough. Yeah. I couldn't find another one, so I had to use mine. But anyway, the audio recordings of the 308 GT4, it just sounds like straight four-cylinder. Yeah. Like it just doesn't, it sounds like a really good four-cylinder, but yeah. in, in person, it's a lot better. Yeah. It's hard to capture that. So maybe we know how much you dislike V6s. I think you can put a past tense term on that. Dislike the V6s. Uh -huh. It's and just it's, you don't like bad v6s just like you don't like bad anything else i like a good v6 right it's hard yeah. to make a good v6 toyota makes a good v6 mm -hmm. it's a 60 degree unit it's in the there Lotuses. are four good v6s right buso buso okay hold on stop back up absolute top of the list dino v6 that thing sounds fucking magnificent from idle to redline under load not under load under overrun it's talking to you it's screaming the mechanical noise is remarkably absent from that car there's a lot more mechanical noise in the 308 mm. which is funny because they went from a chain in the v6 to a belt in the v8 to to tone down the mechanical noise so but the mechanical noise is 15 times louder in the 308 but it's nicer in the in the the, there's all this kind of chain chatter and other weird sort of Valtrain noise in the in the Dino V6 that's yeah. not beautiful, but the intake noise is 
otherworldly. And it's right on the left side, right? The intake is right behind your ear, mm -hmm. where it's right behind the passenger's ear on the V8, which sucks because fuck them. They don't have to pay for the belt service. They shouldn't get the noise. Um, mag fucking magnificent noise. Remember how I told you you needed to experience a Ferrari V6? I hate you when you're right. Yeah. Okay. So that is And you by experienced far. one that was corked. You know, in the Stratos, it was like velocity I watched stacks. Your, I watched yeah, your video. I mean, when you guys should all watch his video too. Because it's it, raunchy. Well, the whole video is almost like a porn because you're sitting there screaming and cursing and basically having an orgasm <laughs> while your arms are, you know, this is all this one does is go to the fucking gym. Every time I talk to him, I just hear weights in the background. His arms are bulging, veins are bulging out. And he's like, fuck, <laughs> fuck. And it was all the fucks were bleeped out. But um, yeah, that seemed like quite a... Um, so yeah, you experience. gotta experience that car. Yeah. But yes, I, I mean, it's a wonderful car. It, it is, and it took me such a long time to come around to this car because I think I had this sort of preconceived notion about what was good. And when I started driving these cars, I was like, you know, 20 because I was at a dealer and mm. detailing cars. And so I started driving these cars around and I was like, yeah, whatever, it's a Dino. And then as I drove like everything that was made by Ferrari from basically 1960 to 1990 mm -hmm. and then i like the more i drove dino's more i was like oh i kind of liked that and it like sort of snuck up on me and then by like when i was sort of like opened my mind to it and acknowledged it, i was like holy shit like this is where it's at i think it's the best driving ferrari there is i mean f40 is up there so is F50. so i've only driven 288 yeah uh with gto which was mechanically similar to f40 mm -hmm. and that's my top three my top three ferraris are 246 308 gt4 and uh, 288 GTO, not necessarily in that order. Yeah. But I think 246 and 288 GTO might be tied for first, or might, that might be first and second. Yep. Until I drive an F40. Yeah, and F50. F50. F50, yeah. I think, is the best 12 cylinder Ferrari to drive from my perspective. Mm. Okay. All right. So, best V6s, though. You said there are four. So, yes. First one is the Dino V6. Yes. The second Buso one, Busso V6. Third one. I'm trying to think from your perspective how they reform. Like, because it's not going to. Okay, but I've V6. never experienced that. Yeah, that's um, good. Is it? I mean, noise no, it is doesn't like the, scream because it's a pushrod engine, but it just has this, you know, 1950s carbureted just texture that, you know, the same way that Gullwing does. It's mm -hmm. just this sort of really the engine is very present. It's very in your face, in a okay. way that 50s engines and 60s engines with carburetors always are okay so it doesn't scream like the ferrari one it doesn't do 7800 rpm but it just for the texture and the noise and the experience and there's this sewing machine character mm -hmm. uh of quality it's mm -hmm. a sensation of quality in that la Lancia engine which i really appreciate okay uh and then the toyota one and the avora interesting that you put that up there i, I mean, mean it's a v6 right. to like right these are yeah. v6s that you like here's, here's another one that's really surprised VQ? Chrysler? No, not VQ. You I'm sorry. Like My nephew who's no. got that G35 is going to kill me. No, I hate that engine. It's terrible. Yeah. To Chrysler's Pentastar. <laughs> it's the I, van. It, well, it's not just the van. I mean, but I, if, when I went back and looked through a lot of my notes, I was like, this, this V6 is unbelievably powerful and sonorous. It never sounds bad. Hmm. And I've never really liked the way they sound uncorked in like a challenger you hear like a v6 yeah challenger. with an automatic and it's it's just it's the wrong sound for that car but i think the pentastar is one of the smoother v6s out there gm's 3.6 liter is also a 60 degree that's a nice engine unbelievably flat torque curve so from an engineering perspective that thing was also pretty good um mm -hmm. but i'll sort of those are a little bit more work a day than yeah not it's um, not inspiring right but yes but that toyota v6 in the like a vor gt with the titanium exhaust holy shit nuggets was that experience mm -hmm. um it was it was very interesting to me because i had a lot of experience in exiges and then i drove an avora and i was like this kind of addresses almost every complaint i have about the exige i just so we did another episode with tess on tesla roadster we shot at the same time and i got a friend's uh elise there because i wanted a bright color elise next to a tesla roadster because they're similar though not as similar as any of you think um Mm. and it's got an exhaust on it uh it's got some mods on it but exhaust and uh it's a naturally aspirated car oh my god the fucking noise that, that i forgot about that intake noise on the cam changeover mm. you know it's very v -y and mm, um oh i might have bought the wrong elise oh no uh yeah i could i could i could sell my elise for for a naturally aspirated one 
And that's not even a case swap. No, I don't think it needs a case swap. With that exhaust mm. on it, apparently, according to the owner, it's droney on the highway or whatever. Don't care. Don't mm. need it as a road trip car. Um, it's orange. Maybe I should just buy that and sell my SC. The SC is a better sort of daily. It's a better everyday use car because it fills in the in, in the torque curve. But um, yeah, I don't like the Avora nearly as much as I like an Elise because an Avora is a GT and an Elise is a sports car. I mean, it's a GT compared to an Elise. <laughs> That's even a GT. It's a usable everyday car compared to a 911 yeah. too. I mean, it's not as good of a daily as a 911, but it's yeah. it's certainly more personality. Yes, I guess filled. that's what it is. Yeah. It, it to me, it, it placed it between a modern 911 and a lease, yeah. and solved the noise problem. I just I really like six cylinder noises a lot mm. more than I like four cylinder noises. Which brings us full circle to the M2, because the other thing that I really don't the, my other impression was the mechanical noise is almost totally gone in mo- modern cars and it's you know ameliorated by stereos and whatever right and you hear fuel injectors it's a lot yeah. of fuel injector noise that m2 inside the car at 5000 rpm just hanging out if you wanted to is a terrible terrible noise <laughs> and i have a really hard time with any straight six that's harsh and coarse that's mm. not acceptable when you know an m20 or an m30 or any of the bmws from the S52. 1970s s52 i mean look things get harsher as compression ratio goes up they get harsher when they go from two valves to four you know there's a, there's a, all yeah, but the s52 i mean is an example of a car that has four valves per cylinder and a reasonable compression I mean, it's ratio nowhere near it as still smooth. sounds good it sounds good and it's nowhere near as smooth as the m20s were you know but when you have a cast iron block to absorb some of the nasty noise and the vibration um and a short stroke and a you know and a relatively low compression ratio you have this recipe for v12 smoothness from a straight six that's totally gone on the modern cars the dino v6 not only is it smoother than the flat plane crank v8 and the 308 um but it sounds orders of magnitude at all rpm and load conditions better than a modern turbocharged straight six and that to me is not okay and it is a level of pace that you can use you can drive the car flat out you almost kind of have to drive the car flat out a lot of the time which is just such a rewarding and joyful experience it's just this wholeness and delicacy to the whole experience i there was some book i was reading about the 246 or the you know that car specifically mm-hmm. and the the author kept using this word that made me like uncomfortable but then as i thought about it i was like oh he's actually right and the word is confection Right, he kept calling the car a delightful confection. I was mm-hmm. like, "A, that's extremely British and sort of strange." But there's something about this car which is like it's really a treat. Mm-hmm. It's just there's this joyful, like indulgent experience, like that you get from, I don't know, choose candy of your choice. But there's something really tasty about that car. It's, it's an just, Elise with a beautiful, especially these early cars, beautiful styling, beautiful interior, and none of the plasticky shit quality of it so it rides well it is yes because it was and it was done of course before fiat got involved in ferrari and this so, one certainly yeah the yeah. late cars were the late cars yeah right? they did fiatize them so that's another reason why the l series 246s are worth more because they have that sort of old interior. world you know charm. um anyway a, an annoying surprise because now i can add another car to my list that i absolutely cannot afford but is 100 yes. percent worth I would say to anyone spending a half a million dollars, I can't, I hate saying this, but you want to spend a half a million dollars on a Ferrari, you buy a 246 Dino or a million, whatever. It doesn't. Yes, it depends on what kind of driver that person is, though. You know, some people would rather have a Pista. Yeah. Sorry, not me. Yeah, no me contest. Either. Of course. No contest. And that's the thing is the, the trap is you wind up as a, as a journalist sounding like, you like some some bitter <laughs> jaded old man yeah. and the problem is you can't exist in a world even though it's my job half the time to exist in a world of only modern cars and when i judge cars as only modern cars sure an m2 is great and sure a 911 is great but I, as a car enthusiast i think we all owe it to ourselves to go back and experience what things were 40 50 years ago and i know they can't happen we you can't know. make those again, of course, but you can buy them now. Still. But if you don't buy the bullshit that you're fed from the car companies about, oh, we must make this thing for a thousand pounds, and you go to Miata, you look at Mazda and what they've been able to pull off, which is what it totally contradicts what every other car company is saying. You can't make a car smaller. You can't make it lighter. You can't make it more efficient. You can't do this. You can't, you can't, you can't. They say you can't, but Mazda done did. And 
we have as a society just gone in the wrong direction because there are no cars for sale today that give you a tenth of the experience of that car. And that's why I just hang out with old cars. And that's I why can. I want a Toyota GR86 as a <laughs> with a sport like hatchback shooting brake on it because that gives one tenth the experience of a Dino. <laughs> Which doesn't sound like a good thing the way that you just said it. It's the only one. It's the only, I think... That approaches. That approaches. That, I mean, like a GT3, yes, of course, a GT3 is amazing. Different kind of thing. Yes, it's... You know? it's and it's also the same price as a shitty Dino. It's $300,000 at this point. Yes. Like, no, I don't want a $300,000 full-sized Buick that has a Porsche badge on it. And they've made handle and they're whatever, but they're huge. Anyway. Yes. Um, what a magnificent Well, I'm so surprise. glad you experienced it. Because Me too. it uh, is something that I have sort of come around to. Like I said, I sort of backed into the conclusion that it's kind of one of my cars that I would buy if there was some way to make it happen. Yeah. And I'm glad that you concluded the same. Which yeah. is not surprising given how similar we are. Anyway, this has been the Dino episode. It was maybe like episode 95 or something of the Carmudgeon Show. Doesn't matter. Join us for another episode <laughs> in the future. If you like. Join in next week. Haggerty Podcast. Or yeah, that. Exactly that.